Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Hi, so um, I'm John Crum. Um, from Microsoft Research, and this is Emma Brunskill. She is now an NSF postdoctoral fellow at uh, UCAL Berkeley, and before that, she was she got her PhD from MIT. Before that, she got her master's at um, Oxford University, and before that, she was at the University of Washington. And so she's she's going to talk about um, how to interpret uh, casually given directions to get places. Thank away. you, um, and feel free to interrupt me with any questions during the talk. Uh, so, first off, I'm going to start with a video to illustrate the types of tasks that we're Robot, interested in. Robot, take me down the hallway, past the railing, to the kitchen on the right. So, for in case you didn't catch that, at the bottom, um, I've uh, written out the instructions that Tom gave to the robot. So uh, Tom told the, the robot to take him down the hallway, past the railing, to the kitchen on the right. And you can see that's what this automated wheelchair is doing. Is um, It's followed those directions, it's went past the railing, and now Tom is going to end up actually in the kitchen. And so this is the type of task we'd like to be able to do. We'd like people to be able to naturally give directions and then um, a robot or an agent to interpret what is the physical path that the user means by those directions. So given a sequence of verbal directions, um, what physical path does this correspond to? And there's a number of reasons why we think this is an interesting problem. So the first is for the example we've just seen for automated wheelchairs. So there's a number of cases where um, people may not have the dexterity to handle a uh, manual wheelchair or even a wheelchair with a joystick, but they might still have possession of their vocal cords. And so we'd like um, people to be able to naturally interact with the wheelchair, and particularly over long distances, uh, just say, you know, take me down the hall across the street to um, the post office or other types of applications. The second application we're interested in is home assistant robots. So I would like to be able to have a robot operate in my home and say to the robot, go down the hallway, past the bedroom, and get my book in the middle of the living room. And I'd like to be able to do that for a number of different items and be able to say it in the same way I would to, say, a spouse or a friend, um, instead of having to use a specific language or specific set of words for a robot. And similarly, we could use this for automated vehicles. I could jump into a cab and just tell the uh, uh, cab driver that could be an automated agent, um, you know, go across town until you hit um, uh, the stadium. And then once you're at the stadium, I want to be dropped off at the third gate. So all of these applications are ones that we're interested in. And in general, we think that this sort of representation is a way to try to facilitate natural human agent interaction, um, where the agent is either a robot or other sort of uh, autonomous agent. And that also, th we think that this sort of research can be useful for generating directions um, when agents are trying to give directions to humans. So if a robot's trying to explain to a human how to get somewhere, it would be useful to know what type of representations tend to be most useful for humans um, and think about the process from that perspective. Now, why might this be hard? Well, first of all, there's huge variation. Um, there's a huge variation in the number of ways you could describe a particular physical path. Um, and there's a number of reasons for this. So let's take this picture. So this is a picture um, uh, taken from uh, one of the uh, spaces in the MIT Computer Science Building. And you can see a microwave. You can see a fridge. I would call this sort of a kitchen or a kitchenette. Um, and one person might say something like, go past the microwave. Another person might use a higher level representation like go past the kitchen, and someone else might just simply say go straight because there's nowhere to turn into this and they might just refer to someone going forward. So you can see here that both there are different levels of describing objects and there's also the notion of geometry versus landmarks. So in the example I just showed you, um, someone might have just said go straight versus referring to any landmarks. Um, but in general, depending on the environment you're in, it may be more or less natural to talk about landmarks versus geometry. So if you have a highly regular structure like this, it might be most natural to refer to going left, going right, or going straight. In other cases where you have very large open spaces with a lot of different objects, then it might be most natural to talk about landmarks like go to the information desk, or if you're in a museum, go to the um, modern art section. 
So in this talk, I'm going to be focusing on the scenario where um, the person that's the person or the agent that's trying to interpret the directions actually has access to a map. Um, and so one of the first issues we have to think about in terms of this is, well, how, what type of map do we have? How are we going to represent the environment? And once we have that environment representation, I'm going to focus on the main bulk of the talk, which is given a set of directions, how do we figure out what is the physical path associated with those directions? And then at the end, I'm going to consider two further things. First of all, how can we improve these results by asking questions? And what would we do if we didn't have a map in advance? So first of all, I'm going to talk about how we might want to represent the world. I'm sorry, that got cut off. Um, so what we're going to do here is we're going to drive a robot around an environment. Um, and the robot here is equipped with a SIC, uh, which is a laser range scanner, which basically, for those of you that aren't familiar with it, gives you range information to sort of 180 degrees around the robot. Um, and what you can see here is that as a robot drives around an environment, it can use that range information to construct sort of a metric map of the environment. And you can think of this as being grid cells that are either occupied or not occupied. Um, in addition, we can take uh, camera images uh, to augment our representation of the environment. Now, mapping in robotics has been a really big topic, and most maps look something like the thing on the left. So in particular, this is the third floor of the MIT Computer Science Building on the left. And that's what I would refer to as sort of an occupancy grid or metric map. It sort of consists of a number of different cells, which are either occupied or not. Um, and you could see a potential path that the robot could take through that environment. But in general, people don't tend to think about um, maps on that level of resolution. I don't tend to have a map in my head of sort of from this, you know, one foot is either occupied or not. I tend to think of it at a much higher level in terms of rooms and hallways and things like that. So in some of our prior work, we thought about constructing hybrid metric topological maps. And this means that we're going to have submaps, which are small sections of the environment, where we do kind of have this occupancy grid representation. But then between submaps, we're just going to have rough connections. So I have sort of a topological representation where each of these submaps are nodes. And in general, um, there are a number of different ways to construct hybrid sort of metric topological maps. We were using spectral clustering to sort of separate the environment into um, regions that are tightly connected versus sparsely connected. Um, and we can do all of this in an automatic fashion. So we can have our robot drive around the environment and then construct this representation of the environment. And then what we're going to be trying to do is think about navigating through these topological nodes. And we're going to assume that we know how to get from between, so within a topological node, but we're going to be interested in sort of which connection should we be following at that higher level. So that means when we get a set of directions, what we're going to be thinking about is a physical path where a physical path is a series of topological nodes through our hybrid metric environment. And in particular, we're going to pose this as a global inference problem. Um, so we're going to be thinking about what's the most likely sequence of physical regions or physical uh, topological nodes corresponding to a set of directions. And we're going to um, put this as a graphical model. And in particular, we're going to phrase this as a Markov random field. So throughout the talk, I'm going to use R to describe these topological nodes, which consist of these uh, metric submaps. And then L to refer to landmarks, which are things like railings or kitchens or fridge or a number of other types of object representations. So given that, um, we can write down what is the probability of an underlying set of physical regions given a set of landmarks. And we're going to do this by uh, thinking about two different types of potentials. So they're going to be potentials associated with uh, landmarks and regions, and then potentials that are only associated with regions. So the arrow here, I thought uh, Marco Randall Field is a directed graph. So when you have arrow here, what does it mean? It's true. Um, so in general, it is, a, it is an undirected graph. We're sort of, um, I put the arrows there to, because I think of it in terms of uh, the, the temporal sequence. But you're right that we don't actually have to represent those. In general, so these are. Well, I mean, since you do have the causal relationship, would it be more natural to think about uh, as a Bayesian network? 
Yeah, you can think about it as I mean, what we originally started with was with a hidden Markov model, but I'll talk about in a little bit why that doesn't end up being appropriate for this application. Mm -hmm. And so your goal is to infer the sequence R1 through R, Rn? Exactly. Okay. And, and so that, that gives you the, the region in the map, but it doesn't yet tell you how to navigate within that region. Does it doesn't tell you how to navigate within the submap regions, but the assumption is that um, if you're a robot doing something like line following or something like that, that you already have primitive motor actions to get you in between connected topological pieces. Okay. So as um, I just answered, the, um, the process that we're going to be trying to do is try to find the um, sequence of physical regions that maximizes uh, this likelihood score. And in particular, that's going to uh, mean that we need to have ways to represent the potentials of uh, the connection between regions and landmarks, and then the potentials across regions. So how might we do this? Well, let's think about our map. So what we'd like to be able to do is say, if someone talks about a conference room, we'd like to be able to think about what's the probability or what's the potential that um, region R1 is the region that they're referring to when they say conference room. And this is where the variation gets slightly tricky. So someone could have said conference room, or they could have said go past the projector, or they could have said there'll be a room with a lot of chairs. And there's really, in general, a huge number of ways that you could describe a single region. So one possibility is that we could sit down and we could train a huge number of different object detectors. And then we could run those object detectors on our environment and we could collect a very, very large set. And then we could do this for all possible landmarks that we think someone might mention. But there are two problems with this. One is that that's a really costly process. It typically takes quite a while to train these object detectors. And while some of them are already uh, available, there's a lot of object classes that do not have pre-existing object detectors that you could just download off the web. Um, the second is that even if we did this for an extremely large class, say 100 or 1,000 um, different landmarks, it's still fairly brittle because someone else could come along and use a slightly different word um, that wasn't in our set, and we wouldn't be able to have good uh, observation potentials for this new landmark. So we're going to take a different approach. We're going to um, sort of do something that I refer to as detect and bootstrap. So the idea is that we're going to build up a few object detectors, and then we're going to run that in our environment. And that's going to give us a small set of object classifications or object detections. But then what we're going to do is we're going to leverage contextual relationships um, in an existing database in order to essentially uh, infer landmark probabilities for a huge number of other landmarks. So for the first part of this, we're just going to train up a few object detectors. Um, and so, for example, here we've got railings, we've got doors. Um, we use Belzen-Schwab's algorithm, but there are num a lot of different existing uh, object detector or algorithms that you could use. The key thing here is that this part, we actually do have to label images by hand and train up these object detectors and then run them over our environment. Now, what do I mean by contextual relationships? So, this is probably looking fairly familiar, given the space that we're in right now. Um, so you could imagine that maybe you're in a space where there are chairs, there might be a couple doors, there might be a screen somewhere, and there's a clock. And in fact, often, we see these types of relationships in conference rooms, just like we're in right now. So in general, you wouldn't be surprised if someone referred to any of these different landmarks for this particular environment. If they called it a conference room, if they said there's a screen, if they said there's chairs or a door. Um, and we expect that a lot of these items tend to be co-located in this sort of environment. So where might we come up with a place that already has these types of contextual relationships um, pre-encoded? Well, the nice thing is that there's an extremely large database called Flickr, which is already publicly available, where people upload pictures and then they tag them. So for example, in this image, they have already tagged that it could be a conference room and that there are chairs and there are screens and things like that. So if we look at um, downloading a bunch of images from Flickr and look at what the tags and co-occurrences are, they're sort of what you might naturally expect. So if you, we look at desk, the most common tag that co-occurs with desk is office. We also th see things like computer and Mac and work. And all of these things we think could be useful in terms of trying to describe spatial regions. Um, and there are sort of different ways that people might describe the same spatial region, because that's exactly what Flickr does. Yeah, so, so, uh, just to make sure I understand, so words that co-occur, 
those are this the frequency. Yes. So for all of our desk images, for all images that had tags of desk, what are all the other tags that those images had? And so, the so that means desk and office co occur. Huge number of times. Yes, exactly. So of the images that we downloaded, the most frequent uh, other tag that was co occurring with desk was office. Um, That's within the same image. Within the same image. Yeah. Exactly. These are all tags for the same image from a very large set of uh, images we downloaded from Flickr. So that, that, that's actually a pretty good list. I was, I was trying to see if there were any um, verbs or adjectives in there besides objects. And I guess I see a few. There's, there's black um, and there's work for a verb. But, so you didn't do any kind of filtering to Get a, a nice set of no, here. we didn't. So I mean, the you could imagine doing filtering on top of this, but no. I mean, there's there's some stuff lower down that I wouldn't have thought of as much. I mean, it sort of makes sense to me, like wood and university. I wouldn't have thought of those as being the first words that I think about with spatial relationships and desk. Um, but because we're only going to end up using words that people actually use in their direction set um, and using those co-occurrences, then it doesn't. Um, if there are words that people don't end up using much, then it's not much of a problem. We're also doing fairly simple parsing right now, so we're only sort of looking for nouns and a couple different types of verbs. If we were doing um, more sophisticated uh, verbal analysis, then it's possible you'd get confusions if you had a lot of other verbs that were co-occurring. So how do we use this? So in order to compute these observation factors or observation potentials, what we first do is we take our uh, existing map and then we run our object detectors that we've pre-trained um, on a small set of object classes. So for example, in this case, we would have had to have trained a screen classifier, a chair classifier, a door classifier, and a clock classifier. And in this environment, uh, this particular region has all four of those. And then for a particular landmark, say LK, then the potential is basically um, a combination of considering all of the different objects that are detected in that region uh, and that landmark. So we're sort of using um, almost a naive Bayes thing here. We're just taking the product of each of these individually. And then the way we compute an, an individual potential is just looking at co-occurrence co data. So we simply look at how often was a screen uh, co-occur in the same image as conference room in our Flickr data set. And the nice thing is that we can do this for a very large number of different landmarks, so roughly on the order of 20 to 25,000. OK, so that's how we do the observation computation and compute the observation potentials. The other thing that um, we want to think about is the sort of uh, potentials that have to do only with the physical regions themselves. So remember that I said earlier that what we've got here is a topological map. Um, so here I've put red dots um, in sort of in the center of each region that would be sort of a topological node in this environment. Um, and what we're going to represent the potentials as is they're going to be one if a region is connected um, to another region. So if it's a neighbor, it's also one if it's itself. So you could have self transitions. It's zero if there's a loop. Um, so if there's a non-self loop, uh, those are unallowed. And then it's zero otherwise to prevent, you know, you can't teleport from here to here, at least not yet. Now this is where um, you might be wondering, or you know, you might have been wondering before and you might wonder again now, why are we using a Markov random field instead of an HMM or other type of representation? So this has to do with the connectivity of the environment. So let's consider um, this particular topological map. So the point up above uh, at the top is connected to five other regions. And then this point down here is only connected to two other regions. And in fact, the point over um, on the far left is actually connected to only one other region. So we have different types of connectivity within the environment. Now, why is that important? Well, recall from the previous, what, previous slide that what we're doing is we just have sort of a uniform um, potential of transitioning to any other uh, node that you're connected to. So on the previous slide here, um, you just have a, a uniform uh, potential for any other immediate neighbor or for transitioning to yourself. Now, if we're in a hidden Markov framework, then you normalize the transition probabilities, which means that if you're in a highly connected region, 
then the probability of transitioning to any other region is lower than it is in low connected regions. So for example, in this case, if we ignore self, self transitions for a second, then there's a 20% probability of this transitioning to any other uh, node, whether, whereas here there's a 50% transition probability. And this ends up biasing uh, your inference. So um, if you use a hidden Markov uh, approach where you have to normalize these, then you effectively penalize paths that go through highly connected regions. And in general, we don't want to have a bias either way. We don't want to uh, bias our most likely paths to go through highly connected regions or low connected regions. And if we instead use this Markov random field approach, then we can just have flat potentials and we don't actually have to normalize them for an individual transition. So that's why we made that choice. Okay, so now I've described to you how we could compute these observation potentials and these transition potentials. And once we have both of these, then we can use pretty standard algorithms to actually do this most likely uh, physical path computation. So we're gonna use a variant of the Viterbi algorithm, which for those of you that aren't familiar with this is um, a very popular algorithm that uh, was invented in the late 60s and has been used a lot, particularly in sort of speech processing for whenever you have a sequence of hidden states and a set of observations. And now, one thing I should mention here is that to start, we're assuming that um, we have a one-to-one -one correspondence, which means that we're assuming that someone is gonna mention every single physical region that they pass through. Now, we'll consider relaxing that later, but that's the initial assumption. And then we're gonna figure out the most likely uh, sequence of physical regions that are associated with that direction set. So if we think about the complete process, what we're first going to do is we're going to have our robot traverse the environment. And when it does this, it's going to build up a sort of metric map of the environment, and it's going to have a lot of different associated images. So we're going to take a large number of pictures as we traverse this environment. Then once we have that original data, we're going to compute a map representation. So we're going to compute a hybrid uh, metric topological map. And then we're also going to run as, uh, object detectors for a small set of object classes over that environment. So here we've done uh, extracted chairs. And then we're going to compute um, all of the relevant potentials for a number of landmarks. Now what we do initially here is we compute potentials for, uh, I think, roughly 25,000 landmarks. Um, but you can always add additional landmarks later if anything appears in your uh, actual direction set that you didn't see originally. And those are very easy to compute because you don't have to train new object detectors. Then what we're going to do is actually collect directions from people. And then we're going to try to uh, parse those directions and infer the path that that person meant. So what sort of data set are we looking at here? So this is the third floor of the Computer Science Building at MIT. And you can see it's sort of an interesting building. It was uh, designed by Frank Gehry. It can be sometimes a little confusing to look at these maps if you haven't seen them before. This is from laser range, uh, a laser range scanner. So you can see here that sometimes the laser range scanner uh, sort of bottoms out. It has a fixed range it can get to. So you occasionally see these sweeping things if it doesn't actually hit that range. But in general, one of the interesting things about this environment is that um, it's not particularly rectilinear. So there's sort of a lot of open spaces. There's, uh, and there's sort of these interesting spaces up here. And this is the environment that we asked people to actually give directions within. We also have vision odometry, LIDAR, and then um, a small set of detections for object classes. So, so how does the direction that human give uh -huh. go into this background field? Is that treated as um, observation? Or is it treated, treated as, as observations. Okay, so yeah. the word sequence becomes the observation. Exactly. The, the word sequence becomes, we parse it to extract nouns and a few other keywords, and then those become the observations. So we take this data set, and just to give you a sense, we're running you know, a few different object detectors on here. Um, and so in this case, we have monitors. And you can see that uh, monitors only appear in a subsection of the regions. Um, and this is, these object detections are what we're using to bootstrap the Flickr learning to compute all of those um, observation potentials. So monitor, chairs, and a couple other object classes are what we're using when we're trying to compute all of the probabilities that, in other words, say, you know, computer or keyboard is going to be co-located with these uh, detections that we do have in case someone else refers to those. Mm -hmm.
It seems like at this point you'd be in a great position to automatically label the rooms. Too. You so, mean in terms of type and stuff like like yeah, kitchen versus? Yeah, right. Absolutely, yeah. No, and one of the things that we uh, that my colleague uh, Tom Collar is working on too is things like you can use this to figure out the type of the room and what objects are co-located with it, which means that if I said something like "Go get me a coffee cup," it could figure out what are the spaces where it's most likely to be, which is kind of nice. Okay, so what was the experiment we did? So we took this area and then we segmented it. Um, there are how many? Roughly 24 regions here. Um, and then we gave this map to subjects and we said, go explore the environment and then give people directions between a start and an end location uh, of one of these regions. But you can't use these region labels to refer to the environment. Just do it as if someone came up and asked you a question about getting to this particular point and how you would give them directions. Um, and then we got other people to try to follow those directions in this environment uh, without these labels. So as I said before, we have about 25,000 landmarks. Um, we used WordNet to sort of extract different levels of um, the types of landmarks people might use for spatial uh, information. So you can go sort of up or down in granularity from kitchen down to spoon and, and things like that. But these are some of the images from the environment just to give you a sense of the number of different ways you could imagine referring to this. So depending on what is salient to you, you might pick up on the fact that there's a bike here. You might refer to this as an office. This might be um, a fridge or a kitchen. Uh, there's monitors. So there's really a very large number. Um, we didn't ever encounter words that weren't in our initial database in the directions, but it would be very easy to add that on top because of the very large nature of the Flickr data set and the tags available. So what's an example subject direction? So one example would be head down the hallway with the open area on your left and the railing on your left. At the end of the hallway, take a left and head through the open area with the computers on your right, and then head into the conference room across the bridge to your right. That would be an example direction. Yeah, so you throw out everything else, just keep all the highlights. Yes, so we're doing pretty simple. So originally we were doing parsing by hand. For this first set of data, we were doing parsing by hand. The second set of data, we're doing automatic parsing, but we're still basically just doing nouns and a couple known verbs. And we're considering uh, doing more sophisticated. Yeah. Sequence is important. Which goes first? So do you put through everything as a bag of words? Or do you no, no, it's sequence? in sequence. It's in order. So we assume there's a term. So we preserve the order, but we're still throwing out a lot of other information that you could imagine getting just from the verbal parse. Now, one thing that uh, we saw, which was as expected, is that there's a lot of variation in how people give directions. So the next three examples are all for the same physical path, and yet people use very different ways to describe it. So for example, here people say, um, proceed past the kitchen and walk through uh, the pair of doors that are on your left. So this person is picking up on the fact that uh, for them, a kitchen is a salient feature, and uh, that's something someone's going to pass through. For the next person, I, they didn't refer to any landmarks in this part. They said, go through the doors and all the way down the hallway. So for them, geometry was sufficient. They just said, look, you're just going to go straight. You don't have to make a decision for a while. It doesn't matter that there's a kitchen near there. Um, I'm not going to bother to represent that part. Now another person actually referred to sort of specific objects like copier machines and a restroom. And now this is interesting because a restroom is to me on the same sort of uh, semantic generality as a kitchen, but yet yeah, they didn't bother to mention the kitchen because the kitchen wasn't relevant for them. So in these cases, you can see that people are using very different types of representations um, in order to represent the same physical path. So these are our initial results. Um, so the first thing to note is that this is a fairly challenging task. So for any of you who've ever been to a Gary building, um, Gary buildings tend to be uh, quite unusual and very tricky. <laughs> I always find that when we were trying to order pizza or something, we'd normally just go help get the delivery person because it was much too hard to give directions. So people could follow these directions um, about 55 out of 80 of the times. But one thing that was encouraging to us is that our Markov random field approach got 47 of those correct. So it's a challenging task, but we're doing pretty well relative to humans in this set. Now, another thing you could imagine doing here is just guessing. Uh, which direction, which uh, spot you're going to end up in. And that would be only about five correct. So it's, it's much more, uh, we're doing much better than sort of chance guessing of where you should end up. 
The next thing we see here is that um, a Markov random field really is a better approach than a hidden Markov model in this case because of the normalization that I was discussing earlier. So this becomes a particularly big issue um, the longer your path length. So if your paths are only sort of one or two, you've got less of a likelihood of actually having to traverse through one of these highly connected regions. But as your paths get longer, it's more likely that you're going to go through one or two highly connected regions, um, which severely penalize the likelihood in the hidden Markov model case. So as you continue to go longer and longer paths, the hidden Markov model will sort of try to go, uh, try to avoid these highly connected regions more and more, whereas the other ones are not both people and the Markov random field isn't, aren't trying to penalize highly connected regions. So we're fairly happy with this first environment, but it's still not that large of an environment. We wanted to try bigger examples. So the second um, environment we looked at was a, a multi-building environment. And um, on the MIT campus, a lot of the buildings are connected. So even though this is all a single floor, it uh, represents a number of different buildings. And this is an interesting environment for a couple reasons. You can see already that it has a very different structure than the last picture I showed you. So there's a lot more rectilinear structure, um, and it's also much larger than before. So how do you do here? For human, since you throw away a lot of words uh -huh. in others, such as turn to uh, turn right versus on your right. Now in your observation, you both have just right. Do you have turn all this? So it's very ambiguous so if you throw out, throw out all this information. Right, actually, no, that's a great point. So that's one of the, um, that's going to be one of the challenges we show here. And then we incorporate turning right or turning left. And turning right or turning left end up becoming part of the region probability transitions instead of part of the so observations. That has a rudimentary understanding of the natural language somehow. Exactly. Otherwise, so the way you are doing now, you throw away a lot of those. We throw away too much. And actually, I'm just about to discuss some of the challenges that come up with this new data set. And, where some of those are just about the parsing and trying to under, get a better sense from the natural languages. Yeah, no, it is. <laughs> well, and I'll show you in a second, that's not the case in this environment. So, um, so 15 subjects gave directions between 10 pairs of locations in this environment, and then we had 15 other subjects try to follow those directions. And the interesting thing for us here is that people did very well. They got 85% correct. So this was a very easy environment for people to navigate in. And our approach got 8% correct. So we did much worse than before, and people did much better. So we looked into, well, why is this? Like, what, what's it about this new environment, and what are the new challenges? So the first challenge um, is that people don't describe all of the regions that they go through in the environment. So often people say things like, starting in this hall, walk straight until. And that's a pretty natural thing to do, because in a lot of these places, there's really no choices. You can't do anything except for either stop or go forward. So it's not, uh, people don't view it as necessary to describe all the things you're going through. In addition, some of these aren't particularly um, sort of visually salient. You know, it can be a long corridor. There are a number of offices on either side, but there's not really a lot of things that you might expect people to bother to refer to. So that's one challenge. The second thing is that people use a lot of geometry. So they use things like turn right into the hall, go straight into the hall T's. They occasionally refer to or don't refer to corners, which are often changes in sort of physical regions, but um, may or may not be places where people can make a choice. So geometry ends up being a lot more important in this environment. And another interesting thing is that viewpoint is much more important. Um, so because you're going to be doing a lot of these sort of right and lefts um, without necessarily a lot of uh, salient visual information, then a lot of it depends on your orientation. So right and left obviously depends on which way you're facing. And if you don't incorporate that information, you often do much, uh, much more poorly. And the final thing that I find particularly interesting is the use of sort of negative information or side information. So people often say things like, right before the glass doors turn, or if you reach the kitchen, you've gone, so, gone too far. And one of the interesting things to me about that is that in a way, you can think of those as virtual loops, that that's either like an actual loop that people are sort of making in their directions, or a virtual loop that you could be making. And that even though that makes the path longer, if it's a very visually salient thing, that can give you so much much localization information that it's worth it to like either have this virtual loop or actually go further because you then completely collapse your uncertainty about where you are. So how did we try to start tackling some of these challenges? 
The first thing is that we automated processing before we were doing this um, by hand, and that's not tractable when you start trying to do this for um, la larger environments for more people. Um, and the second is that uh, we're more systematically including right and left directives, because that's something that people use very commonly and is quite important. The next thing we did was we added viewpoint to the hidden state. And we're using um, four different orientations right now. And uh, the way we do this is that we search over viewpoints. We always know which region you start in. And we search over which uh, viewpoint you might start in. And then essentially, instead of only trying to infer the physical region, we're trying to infer the physical region and the orientation as you traverse through this environment. And then the other thing we tried to start handling was skipped regions. So in a lot of cases, as I was talking about before, if there's not a lot of choices, people will skip descriptions. And so you could imagine it's something like this. Someone might say, go through a metal door, turn right, and then turn right again and you'll reach a room with a bench. And that might ignore all of this space because there's really nothing else you can do and they, you just assume you're going to go forward. But that means that we've got a huge number of regions where um, there is no associated observation. And so as an initial approach to this, we allow there to be a, a fixed number of skips. So we say that people can incorporate here, um, can have a few different missing observations, but you can still have passed through a region. And all of these things help where it gets us up to about 30%. Uh, so it's promising that uh, we can start to do better in this environment, but there's still a reasonable amount of work to go. So what are some of the things that we think are important? Well, we think we need to do even better alignment models. So um, we need to do skips more efficiently. So people in the sort of natural language uh, com community and uh, the speech community have thought a lot about this, of sort of how do you align the observations to a set of hidden states. And so um, we're going to leverage more of their work. And then we also want to think more about descriptions being out of order. So sometimes people will have sort of parenthetical descriptions or later in the sentence refer back to something they described before. Um, and if you just assume that everything is done in the order that someone should see them, then those things can uh, mess up your directions. The second is a better use of geometry. So there's a number of different types of geometrical things that you could imagine referring to. There's left, there's right, there's straight, there's going around corners. Um, and uh, this ends up being particularly important in these types of environments. And then also including things like negative information or side information. So I talked about negative information before, like these sort of self loops you might do if uh, you say things like, if you reach this, you're going too far. Um, but people also use a lot of side information. Things like, on your left will be a kitchen. And so that means that it's not actually an observation associated with the region you're in right now. It means that it's just something that's viewable. And so that's another way we'd like to incorporate viewpoint, is that if we know what the viewpoint is, then we can use neighboring regions around your current region and think about any observations that might be visible from that section. And that should also improve our observation uh, potentials and the likelihood of the paths we infer. And one thing I was interested to see recently is that when I was looking at, on Bing to look at directions, um, it does include negative information, but sort of at a high level. Like if you see the street corner, you've gone too hot far. And they do include some outside information, like you'll pass a pizza hut. But it's fa still fairly restricted. And I think there's a lot of room, um, particularly for vi visually salient things, like you go past uh, the car wash with the pink elephant or things like that, um, that people really pick up on when they're doing directions. Now, everything I've talked about so far is sort of assuming that someone's written down a set of directions for you and then raced off, and they've left it on your desk, and then you have to follow them. But in a lot of cases, I know when I go into sort of a uh, you know new office building or something like that, I'll ask someone for directions, I'll write them down, and then I'll say, do I go past the gym? Or is that you know do I see the information desk on my way? And I have a just little bit of opportunity to ask a couple direct uh, questions before you know the other person's busy or before I need to go try and follow them. Uh -huh. I would guess MIT students know how to give directions that can actually be followed to get you there. <laughs> uh, maybe it is with your text. Have you tried the general public? With the, with, whereas the sense can get so vague that nobody can follow things. Right? I think in MIT they're pretty vague too. <laughs> okay, it's pretty bad. And actually, I mean, just this morning I was trying to get here and asking someone for directions. And uh, what I personally try to do normally is I don't think I can't store them all in my head. So after about three, I just ask again. So I'm always doing greedy direction following, and I only go a couple in advance before I have to ask. <laughs> 
this uh, robotic application you mentioned earlier. Uh -huh. So once you get direction and then you, uh, the you know a macro rainfall infers what kind of regions you might have. Yes. So how does it how how does it control the robot here? So then what happens is, um, uh, then the robot, I don't know if you saw the wheelchair video at the beginning, but then we have an automated... Uh, yeah, well, we have an we have an automatic wheelchair, which um, you know it. In, we have a nice demo where it interprets the directions, and then it just takes the person there. Oh. Once it knows what the physical path is, I'm not. Maybe that's not your question. No, no, but, but the question is that you know, the inference of macro random field only uh -huh. gives you the sequence of the region. Right? Oh, you mean how do you do the within sub map? Yeah. So given that information, mm -hmm. inference, how do you actually navigate? So um, the, our assumption is that you have primitive uh, sort of, you already have in place primitive uh, motor control to get you in between the, uh, in between the sub, sub maps. Oh. So that if I know that I'm supposed to, so let's say this is a sub map and the hallway is a sub map, that you could tell the robot, you know, transition out of this sub map to the hallway and it would already know how to do that. Oh, so for something like a Roomba, that would be hard, but for something like an automated wheelchair, that would be pretty easy. Camera that, that yeah, the, our wheelchair has a camera and, um, and laser so, rangefinder. So all this work is to serve as a control, higher level control. Exactly. Give the instruction for the robot. Exactly. Yes, yeah, so this is at a higher level control. So this gets me to the second part of, the, or another part of this talk, which is how can we improve these results by asking questions? So the idea is just that this is an iterative process. Uh -huh. Um, many about dumping here. You talk about having and not having a map. Yeah. Now, uh, it's, it's been estimated that about more than half of humanity cannot use a, use a map. Yeah. Again, MIT is a biased sample. Have you already handling that? Um, you mean like they they would find it hard to follow a map yeah. or? Right, so that sort of gets, well, we're not trying to provide directions for people yet, but that's definitely um, a, an important issue. And I think even if you don't necessarily know how to read a map, I think people still navigate off of directions, uh, off of landmarks a lot, and use geometry. So, um, but I'll talk a little bit about that at the end and also what you do if you don't have a map. So here we're imagining that, you know, we get to ask a couple of questions and then that sort of gives us a new distribution over what we think our paths are. So we're going to start with a pool of potential paths. So for example, what Viterbi normally does is it uh, maintains the single most likely path, um, or it outputs the single most likely path. Now what we're going to do is we're going to um, output, say, the top 15 or 25 most likely paths. And that's going to give us a pool of potential physical paths through the environment. And then what we're going to do is we're going to assume that only one of those paths is correct and that there's a probability associated with each path of actually generating the observed directions. So maybe a priori, this is the most likely um, uh, path, and then these other ones are a little bit less likely. So what we can do is, given those, that sort of, uh, those probabilities, we can compute the initial entropy over potential paths, which means that we can just sort of determine, um, does it already seem like there's one single path that is much better than everybody else, or is it everything kind of middling and we're really not sure? And then what we can do is we can think about selecting the question that will reduce the expected entropy the most. So we don't know what the answer is. We don't know what someone's going to tell us. But we can um, compute under each of the possible answers what our new distribution of paths would be. And we're going to have questions like, do you see object x along the path? So for example, um, in these sorts of environments, it might be something like, do you go past the linguistics office or will you, will, will you go past the gym? Um, in general, you know, object X can be any type of landmark. And then we're going to assume that people ask, answer truthfully. Now, in practice, this, this might be wrong, even if people aren't trying to be adversarial, because people forget you know, certain items along the way, or maybe they're like, oh, I think they, they go by that. And then you leave, and they immediately realize, oh, no, actually, you don't go by the gym. So in general, we expect that this probably will have some noise. But to start, we assume that people answer these questions truthfully. And we're going to evaluate this by looking at what's the destination of the most likely path after each question compared to if we don't get to ask any questions, and also to human level performance. And now, we're not allowing humans to ask questions in this case, but what we're just trying to do here is get a sanity check of, can we do a lot better, or can we at least do somewhat better, if we actually get to view this as an interactive process and actually ask questions compared to if you just have a static situation where you get a set of directions and have to infer the physical path. 
And the answer is that, you know, at least in our initial experiments, it certainly looks like asking questions helps. So in this environment, people got 55 of the um, destinations correct to start. If we don't get to ask any, answer, ask any questions, our approach gets 52. But if we get to ask one question, we're up to 57. And if we get to ask two questions, we're up to 61. And this is statistically significantly better than asking no questions by a chi-squared test. And it certainly seems the trend is that it's better than people, um, and it's certainly comparable to people. So this seems to suggest that they don't have any questions asked, but we wanted to see whether or not compared to the baseline of people, does question answering seem to help? And that's one of the... It's effectively giving you another observation. So it's effectively giving you an additional observation that's going to constrain. So you can compute for any question you ask, say, um, is there a gym? What's the likelihood of seeing a gym along a particular path? And so it changes the probability distribution. No, so it's not fair in terms of uh, the people, but what we're trying to see is just in general, um, does it seem to make a, ver a big difference compared to asking no questions? And is the level of performance we're getting better than just you know a single person who doesn't get to ask a question? So who should the question ask? Was the machine automatically? The machine did. The machine automatically so computed what was the right question to ask. Information there, can, yes, so it computes automatically what's the right question to ask in order to, in expectation, get the biggest gain. Easy to do. This kind of dialogue. Yeah, I mean, it can just, you know, it... all these dialogue control strategy that, that people in speech recognition. No, I mean, were you doing this in it? So this is in simulation right now. So this is not a human user experiment. This is if you could query about any objects in the environment, what would we expect to be the best? And so this is ongoing work. And there's a couple things, you know, to do with the questions you're just asking that we're currently wanting to investigate. So the first is we want to consider the cost of answer asking questions. So right now, we're, we just looked at you know, asking one or two or three questions. Um, but in general, you'd like to figure out automatically when to stop asking questions. So it might be that after a single question, um, maybe the answer they give is only true for one path, and you're done. There's no need to ask any more questions. Um, the other is that there's some cost to asking questions. There's both a computational cost uh, for the computer, and there's an annoyance factor for the person you're asking questions of. So we'd like to put this within a decision theoretic framework so that we could um, figure out you know, when is it worth it to ask questions and what's the expected value. I mean, also you can imagine maybe if you're running late, it's really important to start to follow the directions as soon as possible. So we'd like to sort of uh, use decision theory to figure out when should you stop asking questions um, and when is it valuable. And then the other thing that's very important that gets at your question is conducting human user studies. So the first reason for that is that um, there may be quite a lot of noise in people's answers. And if there's a large amount of noise, ans asking questions may be less useful. So we'd like to evaluate that. We'd also like to see what sort of questions people ask um, if we allow them to ask questions in case that's very different types of questions. And we'd like to, in general, see, you know, is the noise sufficiently low that asking questions seems to help in the live environment, either for people or for our automated system? So um, something we're just starting to work on now a little bit is starting to think about, well, what if we don't have a map? So in a lot of cases, I think it's reasonable to assume that you have a map, um, that the person that's trying to interpret the directions has a map. So if you're a tourist in a new city, if you're in the middle of a museum, um, you can be in a new environment but still have a map of that environment. Or if someone's you know, t giving me directions within the place I work, I basically have an internal map, um, and I'm just trying to do interpretation of the directions. So there are a number of cases where that's reasonable. And then there's a number of cases where it's not. So certainly in cases like search and rescue, you, you would expect that the topology of the environment has changed sufficiently that you're unlikely to have a map of it. And you'd still like to be able to follow directions to say, go around the collapsed building and find the crane. Another situation is when you have limited time. So for example, sometimes I'm, I, I'm sure nobody else here has this problem, but sometimes I'm running late. And when I'm running late to try to get to an appointment, mm -hmm. then um, I just ask someone rather than going onto the computer and trying to find the floor plan. I just say, look, how do I get to you know, Office 317? Um, and so in both of these cases, I might know a little bit of information. You might see the immediate um, area around you, but you won't have a complete map of the environment. And so. 
What we're thinking about now is incorporating our approach when you only have partial maps of the environment. So what you can think of here is you'd have a map of the environment with sort of a number of frontiers beyond which you don't have any information. Um, and the reason this makes the problem more challenging is that you have to divide your uh, verbal direction set into parts that refer to the environment that you know about and parts that refer to hidden parts of the environment you haven't seen yet. And so there's sort of cut point inference you need to do as well. And our idea to start with for this is to sort of infer that cut point and then follow your directions until you reach that frontier and then explore a little bit in that frontier and you'll see more of the environment and then repeat this process. And so it wouldn't be a complete global inference, it would be sort of a sequence of greedy local inferences in order to follow uh, map directions. Now, people have certainly thought about, um, you know, giving directions before in the past. Perhaps the most similar work was by Matt McMahon. He did his PhD thesis at UT Austin. Um, and he thought about direction giving, but mostly in virtual environments where you don't have the same um, types of spatial relationships as what we did. So he had these sort of virtual environments where he set up a number of landmarks which weren't typically uh, standard um, spatial landmarks. So it would be things like an easel or a large picture of a butterfly, and then saw how people navigated in this environment and how you could automatically do that. And while that's very interesting, it's using a very different set of sort of features and representation than what we are. And you could imagine perhaps combining some of the different approaches together. Um, Scuba and all uh, a few years ago thought about local human robot interaction, so things like robot go to the pillar, um, where they're thinking about interpreting directions, but not normally a sequence of directions, more, more of a single set of directions. And then there's also been some work on uh, autonomous wheelchairs uh, and interpreting directions for those by Gribble and all and um, Mueller and all, but again, most of these people aren't thinking about it as a global inference process. So um, to conclude, we think that sort of posing um, uh, direction interpretation as global inference is promising, um, and we've got some encouraging initial results. And then one thing I just wanted to mention is that, uh, oops, apparently automated that. Um, it's just that uh, in, in addition to this work, I, I'm interested in a number of other areas, uh, and including reinforcement learning, probabilistic planning, and partially observable d domains. And most recently, my postdoc work is going to be mostly thinking about machine learning and optimization for emerging regions technologies. So I'd be very happy to talk to anybody about any of those things. And thanks for listening. Do <laughs> have any questions? Um, so at one point you were talking about reasoning over uh, a bunch of different possible paths, you looked at the entropy and things like that. It seems like another way to assess the reasonable, to assess which it might be the right path is to look at how reasonable it is. You know, I, I know people give directions, I can give you the, the fast way or the easy way, right? Yep. So the fast way is not always the best, but usually they don't have you grouping way off Know, and, and taking a, a really weird route. So it seems like that might be another way to... No, it'd be nice to have some sort of metric of that, like metric of complication or metric of if you're sort of doing, you know, we're not incorporating any notion of distance, like how long it takes, um, or, you know, traversability or things like that, and it would be nice to have that. So what's the idea of using enforcement learning in this name? Oh, not for this. Uh, for separate things. <laughs> this is just sort of the other, other aspects of my research. So I was mentioning just before this, one thing that I was interested in previously for sort of larger level uh, uh, sort of uh, mapping and navigation applications is just thinking about variance when you're giving directions. So if someone said, well, do you want to go, do you want to definitely be there in 10 minutes or do you want to probably be there in five minutes unless class just got out and it's really busy? <laughs> um, and, and so, yeah, thinking about variance in terms of the directions you give. This work reminds me of the, uh, the GPS. So if you have a lot of information about the maps and you uh, follow what GPS is doing, and just keep the best destination, and you can find the uh, shortest Right, I mean, the G yeah, the, the GPS is uh, definitely do that too. Not normally incorporating, I mean, the GPS is sort of give, GPS is giving you directions as opposed to receiving directions. So we're getting like verbal descriptions of directions, uh, but you can imagine feeding this into a GPS system, or if you wanted to give directions out. I think one thing that we've taken away from this is that if you're gonna automatically direct, give directions to someone, you should incorporate things like negative information and highly salient landmarks, because they'll be helpful to people when they're following those directions. 
So, so what, how much detail do you think the person should be in order to capture the full information of the verbal elements? It's hard to say. Um, so my colleague Tom and um, another colleague of his, Stephanie, who does a lot of stuff on speech, um, is trying to think about much more rich uh, representations like spatial descriptive clauses and stuff like that, which we're not incorporating here. Um, I think it would certainly help. I think there sort of are these rich notions of observations that depend on viewpoint. Um, I think people sometimes say things like go slightly to the left around things. So there's certainly a lot more geometry and types of spatial relations you could incorporate. To what extent do you change the model? To the oh, well, so that's sort of an open area of research. That's not something that I've focused on, um, but I think you, you'd probably want to push most of that into sort of the transition probabilities um, and thinking of uh, those observations as changing the transition probabilities. Yeah, well, or just, yeah, changing the linkages between those. I mean, we're doing that right now for right and left. That's basically saying whether, you know, le the viewpoint in left and right is changing what's the probability of going between regions regardless of any landmark observations. So do you have automatic way of training those probabilities somehow? We don't right now. I mean, we just can, we just incorporate those by hand. I mean, I think one thing that would be interesting too that we were talking uh, briefly about before was that uh, you could also learn patterns. So right now we're just assuming a uniform distribution. Um, that's not right. I mean, people definitely have, uh, particularly depending on your orientation. If you're facing forward, you're most likely to keep going forward. You know, and you could imagine learning those uh, from data collected to try to have a more rich type of transition model.